so for the audience, uh, this conversation has been, what have, what have we been going back and forth for like a month on this or something like, uh, something just, like that, just like yeah. trying to figure it out. Um, this, so the origin of this conversation was that someone reached out to me and they were like, Hey, Econo boy, uh, Warren Mosler, basically the guy that as far as I'm aware, basically just the guy that invented MMT. If there is, you know, like one person who really invented the modern monetary theory, it's Warren Mosler. And, uh, you know, he's actually relatively accessible, right? So you might want to reach out to him and, you know, schedule a, a conversation. And one of my, it may have actually been one of the, the mod that I'm about to reference. There's a guy in my Discord named Charlie who is uh, the, the MMT person in our discord and much like any mmt advocate he's very annoying when talking about mmt um but we love him and he's a mod so we we just we just you know yeah yeah you know grandpa with the mmt you know and then you know we move on to other topics but i reach out to warren moser i email him he emails me back and says uh you know, oh yeah, I saw your video on MMT. It was mostly filled with incorrect information about MMT. I was like, well, okay then. Well, if that's the case, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about anyway, right? It's like, let's <laughs> talk about MMT. Obviously, we disagree on it, right? And, um, you know, then he says he, he, uh, he says he does not want to talk to me. So uh, I reach out to you. You send me a video of him quitting a debate with some Italian professor, which was really funny. Um, you know, uh, pretty much Warren Mosler kept trying to interrupt him. And then the Italian professor was like, no, that's not how this debate works. Um, and more Warren Mosler was like, basically, well, if you're not going to allow me to interrupt you, I'm just going to leave this debate's over. And then he left. And, um, yeah. it was, uh, it was unfortunate because I've never seen Warren Mosler talk to someone who, you know, I've never seen him talk to like an economist, basically it tends to be interviews and then like maybe debates with less prepared people. Um, and um or like in the discussion you had with him where it was very like uh it seemed like a combination of uh his fucking virgin island internet kept cutting out and he had to keep on reconnecting to the call um and also steamrolling right so it was it, there wasn't a lot of clash um and so i just wanted to talk about mmt and i was interested to hear you know obviously you're a financial professional um a much different kind of financial professional than I am. I do more like, uh, you could say like corporate and project finance, uh, whereas you might do more, it sounds like uh, maybe investment and analyst type work. Um, and uh, so two sides of the coin there, I figured we could talk about MMT, the main sort of arguments and some things that I've heard about MMT that just sound kind of weird to me. Uh, and we could just yeah. go from there. Yeah, sure. Um... So do you want to give a brief overview of uh, what, in your opinion, MMT kind of is? Well, it's hard to say because Warren said everything I said about it was wrong. But as far as I am aware, MMT is a, a descriptive and pre prescriptive framework um, which attempts to, um, you know, d describe the economy in a certain way and how it functions, mostly with the role of money in government. Um, and deficits, especially, uh, and inflation. And then based off those descriptions, that might naturally leave you to some prescriptions, right? Uh, and it's really the prescriptions that it seems are most objectionable. So, uh, you know, an MMT advocate would typically argue that, uh, you know, the, the government is the sole issuer of the currency, uh, that it pays its debt back in a lot of the times, uh, and people demand this currency. And so, therefore, the role of the government is to maximize the productive capacity of the economy and to the extent that the productive capacity of the economy is maximized on the back of either a lot of government spending or very little government spending um that's when you should stop spending money because at the point that you've you know maximized your productive capacity that's when you're going to hit inflation there's nowhere else for the money to go right and so that's what mmt describes the economy like and then the prescriptions from that often tend to be that um, you know, the central bank is using the incorrect mechanisms for controlling inflation. We shouldn't use the central bank and interest rates. We should use the fiscal state and basically, you know, the, uh, you could say budget packages to control inflation. Um, and that's better for one reason or another. 
Um, yeah, uh, I think the biggest thing that uh, I get about MMT is basically the story. So the story basically goes, uh, uh, in order to uh, have a society, it, you need uh, a government who can kind of like uh, correct wrongs more or less, right? And so in order for that government to exist, it has to pay for things that society needs. And so it needs to do so by taxing. Uh, but what do you tax? Uh, well, what you do is you create a currency that only your society can kind of uh, use um, and uh, to pay its debts. And so you issue it, you buy things, and then you tax it back from the citizens. And at the end of the day, you um, end up with the things uh, society needs, and you've now created a medium of exchange for society. Uh, the biggest thing for me on the MMT uh, kind of story is it doesn't really match up with how societies uh, evolve. Um, in the future or in the past and it doesn't really describe how money works for really any society beyond maybe america and west europe and to a certain extent japan um and what really concerns me about it is um everybody who talks about it say it's a description it's a description of how it happens but then they go out <laughs> and they give prescriptions off the description so yeah. even if we grant the description works uh, as it does because it does to some extent kind of work that way in western society when you start giving prescriptions that are backwards from reality it, it definitely doesn't help and when you take a look at um you know inflation drivers uh when you when you say oh well it's reverse causation um of uh, interest rates uh, and inflation well we have very good um uh, theoretical grounds as to why all right why does it make sense if we create more money than the uh, or sorry if we uh, lower the interest rate then inflation will go up or if we raise the interest rate why inflation goes down we have a theoretical driver for it if you're going to call, uh, call reverse causation, you, you need a theoretical underpinning uh, of why it, it kind of works rather than just saying, oh, no, it's the opposite. Oh, no, it's the opposite. And so well, that's... yeah, I mean, it, it seems like, at least in regard to that, it seems like basically MMTers who make that claim are pushed into a corner because you've got essentially 45 years of history of interest rates raising and then, at least according to MMT, coincidentally, inflation falling. Um, and then you've got 45 years of narratives of, you know, why is it that every single time interest rates get raised, inflation falls in basically every single country. And then, you know, if you talk to a guy like Mosler, he'll literally give you a hundred different stories as to why that is, except for interest rates <laughs> increasing as the explainer. Right. And that's, a uh, you know, a little, uh, I don't know, a little convenient, I suppose. <laughs> Yeah, so let me go take a look. Uh, we haven't... Uh, oh, okay, so um, I, I think uh, the best uh, MMT story that we can actually take a look at is one that's playing out in uh, Turkey right now. So um, Erdogan famously, uh, you know, uh, fired his economist uh, in 2020 uh, or 2021. I think it was at the end of last year, maybe. Um, do you remember, or maybe it was 2018, uh, do you remember uh, that uh, and he replaced it? Uh, the inflation or the interest rate keep, kept going higher and higher. Uh, and he eventually fired the economist and said, all right, well, we can just create money. We can follow the MMT story. Uh, and he yeah. put in a well, the central he, banker, yeah, he, he got rid of the basically Federal Reserve equivalent head and basically decided that, you know, we don't need, um, you know, we want to, we want to, we want to, we want to. Well, yeah, we want to continue having this sort of supportive monetary policy. And obviously, you know, Turkey's got like 100% inflation or whatever it is right now. Yeah, it's out of control. It was actually October of uh, last year. Uh, and so we're seeing that literally play out in real time. So I want to say their interest rate was around 20-ish percent. Uh, and they cut it to like 18, I think. Uh, and inflation has basically gone through the roof uh, immediately afterwards. He said that we can print as much money as we want. Interest rates uh, don't dictate it, which is something that the MMT people say. Uh, and it, it's their currency is more or less imploding. So we'll see how that plays out. Maybe uh, maybe we'll be wrong. Maybe in 12 or 18 months we'll be um, you know, saying MMT was right. But I, I have my <laughs> doubt. So yeah. this is probably the best experiment we can see in real time. Well, yeah, so. I mean, maybe Turkey will you know, come out with the most robust economy in the in the region, right? But you know, more than likely, yeah, I, it'll just end up with Erdogan faking another coup or getting overthrown or something, you know, the standard for uh, sort of contemporary Turkish politics. Yeah. And 
um and go from there but yeah i don't i don't i i agree with your my main criticism for mmt is often that as well is that they'll hide behind saying you know oh um it's just a descriptive framework. That's all it is. We're just trying to describe how the economy actually works, right? But then, you know, they'll talk about having like a jobs guarantee or having a, uh, 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 you know, Universal a permanent per and yeah, permanent. Well, sure. Like they'll go more stuff like that, or having permanently zero interest rates, or um, having. I mean, the most dangerous one is having the fiscal state basically control inflation, right? That's the thing that. Um, yeah. That's one of those things that, like, when I'm talking to MMT or. It's like, okay, there's no reason to believe that the fiscal state is just straight up better at controlling inflation than the monetary state. But if even if we grant everything that you're saying is true, I still don't know if I'd want the fiscal state to control inflation because you're basically saying that Congress should be in charge of responsibly taxing when they need to lower inflation and responsibly and or responsibly spending when they need to raise or lower inflation, right? And it's just like... I just don't know if it's reasonable to expect that basically Congress would raise taxes or lower them responsibly in a reasonable in an inf frame. in an inflationary environment. Yeah, and and in the, in a reasonable yeah. time frame because usually every time a new tax gets implemented, it's like, oh, you know, uh, it'll take effect two years from now, and it'll be a step ladder taking an effect, or it'll be like. Uh, you know, it takes effect immediately, but then it tends to, you know, it'll last for 10 years and then eventually the effects will wear off. And it's like, you know, it just doesn't seem like a, a great way to you know, do it. I mean, and, and to be fair, the only tax that I can think of that you could use to control inflation would be like a payroll tax, right? And just the appetite generally for raising payroll taxes is just so incredibly fucking low. Um, like, I mean, imagine, like, imagine right now... For Trump when he cut that. Uh, when he cut the payroll tax or gave it a payroll tax holiday uh, for a temporary reprieve, that was extremely popular. So, well, yeah, and it's 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 not that that's always a bad policy. It's just that, like, mm -hmm. imagine, like right now, right? Imagine if if the only recourse for uh, the Biden administration would be like, okay, yeah, well, we ha we have to raise the payroll tax in order to cut people's paychecks so that we can control inflation. Now, to be fair. In a room of fucking economists and MMTers, right, we might reasonably come to the conclusion that, like, yeah, if that's our only tool, then we have to use it to quell inflation. But, I mean, then you're talking about Biden's approval rating going from 40% to, like, 25 right? Because everyone's going to be pissed off to get a pay cut in the middle of an inflation, uh, an inflationary period, right? Um, yeah, everybody loves having less money when your money is already not buying you enough to... Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And people, I mean, people, I mean, MMTers might come back and they would say like, oh, well, you know, you see, you see rising costs uh, or like, you know, the, the consumer is crunched with raising interest rates as well. Um, and that's not wrong. It's just that you're, you're, you have to take into account the political axis, which is that um, while it is the case, yeah, nobody thinks about it. Right. So like, it is the case that you'll have a higher interest rate when it comes to buying like a car or a house or like consumer credit or whatever it is. That trickles down um the reality is that just doesn't reflect in like approval ratings a lot of the times right i mean like when when volcor raised rates to like 20 percent, right it it wasn't the you know it, you know it wasn't the carter administration or the reagan administration that was taking the heat it was like literally volcker himself right and mm -hmm. as a technocratic institution it's just wasn't really quite uh you know it just wasn't quite as impactful right so i don't know i think um that, that's that's a big issue that i have it just seems like really impractical well, I think more recently you've seen a tie between the administration that's in charge uh, and the economy that's tightened a lot. And you've seen a big um, people trying to tie, I guess, the Federal Reserve with um, with uh, politics as well. Uh, I think Warren was a pretty uh, big one uh, recently doing it, saying that there's too many Republicans uh, in the Federal Reserve, right? As if that really matters. It seems like I don't want to say there's been capture uh, because it definitely has under the Federal Reserve, but it seems like in people's mind, uh, they're starting to tie the two together. Um, and, and so that may cause, you know, more ties between the Federal Reserve uh, and the government. And I guess technically that kind of started with the Greenspan put where he signaled that if there was going to be, you know, taxes, there would be easy monetary policy to kind of boost the economy as well. So you can... I guess you can kind of see it from the individual person's uh, perspective that, you know, the Fed and the government are working together to make their lives worse, I guess. 
Yeah, sure. I can agree with that. Um, my, my only point would just be that like the, you know, it's, it's, a. Uh, it just doesn't, to me, make logical sense why you'd prefer to have a, uh, basically a political body in charge of managing inflation. It just, it, it seems quite a, or like some, like for instance, some MMTers will say, um, well, actually the Fed's already a political body, right? You know, it's, it's already accountable to the, to the, you know, the elected bodies as well. And it's like, okay, well, you know, I, I can understand that. Right. But then there, there's a difference between, like operational independence and operate in a political independence, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, you, you've got the chair of the Federal Reserve uh, has to ultimately be liked by the president and the Senate in order to get the job, right? And that's mm-hmm. the same thing with all the governors as well, the Federal Reserve. Um, but operationally, though, at the point of being confirmed, I mean, it's pretty much like free reign for them to do what they want, right? It's always been considered... The same thing with the military generals. The military or like the courts or whatever, same thing, right? Like, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, I mean, I think the military is probably the best example where like, you know, you could say that, um, uh, well, I don't think the military is a good example because the military is civilian controlled, but, you know, I think that the courts are a good example where it's like, you know, you, uh, you know, again, we, we can say and probably see some examples of partisan hackery on the courts, but I think that, you know, generally the case is that, the partisan pressure on judges, um, see, you know, seems to end once they're actually confirmed, right? They, they are mm-hmm. above that sort of ebb and flow of public opinion, um, for better or worse in some cases. But um, I'm interested in your thoughts uh, on one of the things that I, it seems so descriptively incorrect for, for people that advocate this descriptive framework. And I don't understand the logic. Well, I understand the logic, but it just seems, it seems really wrong. Um, and I talked to a banking economist about this and he agreed with me, but of course, MMTers will say I'm completely wrong and misunderstanding it. And it's like, God damn it. I feel like I'm being gaslit. Okay. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Right. So, uh, probably the most foundational thing in MMT is the idea that the government creates money, right? And, Mm -hmm. uh, you have to pay your taxes with the money that the government tells you, you have to pay it back in. Right. And this is what makes money valuable. Right. Um, and this is why we use money, right? Uh, and mm. <clears throat> instead of anything else. And uh, the first, uh, you know, objection that I've always had to this is, well, the government doesn't create money, right? It's not the only entity that creates money. Banks create money, right? And uh, what an MMT will say is, well, actually, there's no uh, the banks. Banks cannot create net financial assets. Only the central right. bank can do that. Um, and to me, this is odd on a couple of fronts. And it seems my initial suspicions were confirmed by the person I was speaking with, which was that um, while it is true that when a bank issues a loan, that is a, a liability for the person getting the loan and an asset for the, for the bank, and ultimately depositor money is liabilities for the bank, um, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, that bank, uh, that loan will be paid back and it will be paid back uh, with interest, and that loan was created from, you know, fractionally uh, fr- fractional reserves that the mm-hmm. bank didn't actually have. And so, you know, at the point of that loan being paid back, this is new money that's now circulating freely in the system. Um, so that's the first thing is that it seems like net financial assets can actually be created by banks. And then the second thing is that, well, actually, when central banks create money, it's pretty much the same thing, right? So ba- mm-hmm. central banks, when they create money, they're creating that money and any money that they hold is, you know, if you go to a central bank balance sheet, it'll have money as a liability on its, on its balance sheet a lot of the times, um, except for the, like, the IMF. It's accounting principle, yeah. Right. Um, and to the extent that the Federal Reserve or any central bank does things like quantitative easing and puts that money out there, um, well, they're just swapping you know, one thing for another, right? It's, you know, Mm -hmm. and and eventually that money gets created um, and uh, maybe destroyed in the case of, you know, the money coming back, right? So it just seems uh, wrong on both ends. Yeah, so my first question for you is, let's go back to the first example. Uh, I go out, uh, I'm a bank, I give you a loan for $10,000, you pay that back. The $10,000, how is uh, any money kind of, created in that step um so uh once it's paid back right it it seems like 
there's the same creation and destruction process that the central bank has, right? So sure, you get, I, I give you $10,000, you go out and spend it, but you have to go collect $10,000 from whatever you're doing and put it back. So at the end of the day, there's destruction uh, of the same $10,000 that's created when you know you give it back to me, the bank. Yeah, I get that. But then at the same time, that loan that loan has been created from nothing, right? So that loan has been given out with no, you know, there's no, we, we don't have like, what is it called? Fully, fully, uh, it's called, is it 100% reserve? Like, yeah, the, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. fully collateralized, uh, yeah. Sure, yeah. I mean, we, you know, you can create a loan based on just the loan being demanded and you being able to offer it, right? So, I mean, that's sure. where, you know, you're creating new money in the system. Sure, um, but I, I think at the end of the day, um, if we go to the MMT story is no one really cares about paying back the bank, right? If um, you take the loan from me, uh, there's no real demand to do any business uh, in whatever bank money that's created. The whole reason why you have currency is because the destructive power of, of the state um, will incarcerate you or kill you or take all your stuff, right? The bank can only take so much from you, whereas the state creates the actual demand for it to be in you know, US dollars and not JP Morgan coin or, or whatever, what have sure. you, right? Um, and so... That, I think, is a little bit of the story that doesn't seem unreasonable to me in terms of how it describes current societies, right? Because if you go to Europe, well, you're going to be using euros because that's what the, the state issues. And it's convenient enough for everybody that there's not an issue, right? The problem is it doesn't actually match reality everywhere because societies exist with money and have existed with money that haven't had taxes or you can trade across society in things that are acceptable as medium of exchange and store value and whatever like gold for years yeah. so it it matches part of society and if you grant that it doesn't have any economic implications right um, because there's no economic implication of a, a forceful state being able to confiscate stuff from you um, in, in any economic system that doesn't really that doesn't impact any transaction that you do, right? It may impact that we use dollars instead of, you know, Goldman Sachs or coin or, you know, Walmart script or whatever. But at the end of the day, the choice of money is kind of irrelevant for, um, for, 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 for any purpose or the description of any economic system, right? Because uh, theoretically, I can take any model of any economy and then I have to convert it to dollars or to euros or to Martian bucks or, or whatever they use it's irrelevant to how the system operates, right? Because your government forcing you to do stuff is going to be a part of, or can or cannot be part of any system. And that's a political thing. It's irrelevant to any transactions that really go on besides, you know, the, the impact that taxes have on trades. Well, I, I think the reason that it's somewhat important, at least for me, to bring up the idea that descriptively, it's wrong to say that only the government creates money is that, well, number one, it, it just seems to be wrong, right? It seems like, well, no, banks do create money right now. I get your point, which is that mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the story about the underlying value of that money hasn't necessarily yeah. changed, right? We're all just sort of, you yeah. know, fighting to consume and also pay part of our, uh, you know, part of your consumption uh, in taxes, mm -hmm. I suppose. And uh, so I get that, right? I think that where it so kind of comes into... yeah, Maybe we should go to how are we defining money? Because when I think of money... Oh man, this is this is like a econ like one oh one thing. It's been a while. But basically when <laughs> we use money, it means a lot of things colloquially. And it means a lot of things depending on which definition of money that we're using. And I think MMT is really weaselly around it, right? When I think of money, I think of physical bills and coins and things like that that are tender. But when you're talking about money, uh, you're talking about the extended definition of money, things that are essentially like money instruments, like checkings and savings accounts, uh, like um, treasury yeah. bills, for instance. Yeah, and electronic so money. Are, sure. Yeah. And so those aren't the same thing as like physical tender. Uh, and I think that's where right. MIT is playing kind of fast and loose with the rules because, yes, banks in, uh, impact the money supply, but... Um, well, I mean, yeah, it's true that banks don't, uh, I suppose it's true that banks can't create like, you know, they don't print physical money or coins, right? But obviously when we're talking about like a loan that you take out that goes into your business or checking account, I mean, that's as good as any money that, you know, 
Sure, but the <laughs> same thing is corporate paper. When uh, corporations uh, kind of go out, they borrow, they issue securities, that is essentially creating, expanding the money supply as well. Um, it, it just depends on how broad you want to talk about money. Um, well, wait, but how, how, does a, how does a corporation issuing a bond or, or a, a equity expand the money supply, right? Because you're just taking, people are giving you money for, mm -hmm. you know, equity, right? It's, it's a... Well, it's, it's that, not for equity. It's for the promise of repayment. What do you, what do you mean? Explain. So the corporation then essentially becomes the bank. I need money to do stuff. I, I need dollars from somebody. Uh, and so, well, I guess... Uh, yeah, so I guess technically they're getting like physical dollars uh, in their bank, um, and it doesn't right. matter. But what's to, I, I guess, stop them from from just like saying that they got those dollars? Uh, I guess it it's not quite the same. Um, but at the end of the day, are corporate bonds considered? I gotta look at the money supply definitions. Well, bond bonds are different because bonds are the same. You know, every dollar of cash you get from issuing a bond is a dollar that previously existed in someone else's hand, right? Whereas banks have the special role of just creating loans and sort of assets out of thin air, right? Which is, to me, why I would say that... Yeah, to me, that's why I would say that they, like, quote-unquote, create money. Um, but the, the reason, while you're thinking about that, the only reason I bring that up is because it, it does seem descriptively incorrect. Now, you're right, they might be playing around with the definition, but at the end of the day, I feel like that calls into question part of their, you know, perhaps i'd need to listen to an mmt or i've never heard this question answered but like if banks create money and so does the government but we're only relying on the government to control inflation right with fiscal tools uh that's where it seems like mmt would seem to be internally uh you know incorrect or inconsistent you can say mm -hmm. because now we've got banks that basically have no uh no change in their functioning or no change in incentives because that's what the interest rate does right now right is you know you raise the overnight rate that they have to you know keep in reserve or whatever it is and uh that's where oh sorry i know why i was thinking of uh, that i wasn't thinking of um corporate bonds i was thinking of treasury bills because that's m3 um treasury bills repo. yeah well it's, it's treasury bills is m2 i think and m3 is repo agreements um at least for europe um that's what i was thinking of uh yeah, sorry. Yeah. And sure. then I think M4 includes commercial papers. Um, M4 includes commercial paper as well. Yeah. Yeah, well, but that that's my point is that it seems like without the monetary, without the sort of monetary yeah. tools using interest rates, it seems like, you know, ignoring the fact that banks create money seems like you're allowing yourself to be you know, perpetually on the back foot for controlling inflation because, you know, now you don't have a direct mechanism to control the circulation of money well, between sure, banks. The, you can control, you can control uh, your fractional reserve ratio, right? Because the Federal Reserve sets that. And, um, you know, if they change it from 10 to 1 to 5 to 1, well, then you're effectively having the bank call in a lot of those loans. So you still have the same uh, policy, or it's a slightly different policy tool, but you still have a direct policy tool to impact the amount of money uh, in the well, society. Well, I... I've never heard an MMT or talk about this, but you th so you think an MMT -er would counter that by saying, well, you would just raise the reserve requirement. Uh, I mean, yeah, you could if they're issuing too much money, um, and uh, you know, you want to be the one who's issuing it. Then, yeah, you would uh, you would use that to kind of like change the proportion of money, quote unquote, created uh, by the private sector versus the public sector. I, I think that would be their policy lever there. Hmm. I, I okay. just don't think I just think the money creation story is kind of irrelevant to the topic. It doesn't matter if a banker makes it. It doesn't matter if the Federal Reserve allows the banker to make it. I, I just don't think that it, it's kind of relevant to any argument. I, I think it's just kind of it, the, the impact that it has on society. It doesn't matter who creates it or why. Uh, I, I, like, I, I just don't see how that has any impact on any system besides who's making decisions. And at the end of the day, if the government wants to stop it, there's already the policy tools to stop it, if that makes sense. It, it does make some sense. I just, I guess I'm skeptical of, of that as an ability or that, because one of the MMT arguments is that interest rates are a blunt tool to curb sure. inflation, whereas in theory, we could have like a sectorally balanced fiscal package, which in theory would be a better way to curb inflation. Now, again, in theory, that might be correct, but then we're neglecting the political system. reality. Yeah, we're neglecting the... Yeah, go on, sir. 
I was going to say it's literally the same thing as the political reality of like, okay, well, we actually need appropriate fiscal stimulus in these specific sectors, or we need to let up uh, specific regulations revolving around supply chains or production of vital medicine or things of that nature. It basically becomes, all right, well, instead of, um, instead of uh, you know making sure we have the appropriate fiscal and regulatory packages, well, now we just need to target it the same way, but through monetary instruments, which are yeah. extremely difficult to target well, as opposed to easing up regulations. I mean, the, res the reserve requirements, I mean, that's to me at least, that sounds like, maybe I'm wrong, maybe a banker would disagree, but it, that, that sounds like a more blunt tool to control the circulation of money between banks uh, and just, you know, I suppose how the banking system interacts with the money uh, supply in general than interest rates. Um, it sounds like that's like, because at least with interest rates, it's a, a cost, uh, you could say, of, of lending. Uh, but with, you know, raising the reserve requirement, right, it's just, you know, it's it seems like less of a market mechanism, if that makes any sense, right? It sounds like it would be a little bit less uh, uh, efficient. Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to, yeah, it's absolutely going to be a less efficient tool. Uh, I, I think it just depends maybe on, um, I, I would say it's going to be, dependent on the banks for calculating their risk rather than the individual consumers to be calculating their expected value of taking that loan, right? So if you raise interest rates, then people are, are going to, each individual actor is going to have to say, uh, all right, is this now worth it at 3.25 versus 3% or 5% versus 4%? Whereas the bank, if you're raising the reserve requirement, is going to have to say, what sector of loans am I going to have to, or what loans am I going to have to call, uh, call back? Or partially call back to meet these and it's going to be dependent on how large it goes so for interest rates it's a lot the, the impact on the actors uh is a lot easier for that decision to be made whereas for the bank they're having to make it in aggregate and they're making it for other people if that makes sense yeah that makes yeah that does make sense that does make sense. and that's kind of what i figured i guess to me that's yeah. the relevance of bringing up the money creation story is that it sounds like you end up well it sounds like from you know your perspective you either end up reverting to more blunt tools <laughs> yeah. or you end up uh you know i guess uh basically just reverting to the interest rate being a little bit uh a little bit better than what we have now i mean and, and to be fair i think the i don't know what was it in 20 i think it was in 2020 the u.s actually also got rid of their reserve requirement there's like eight or nine advanced economies that don't even have any reserve requirements anymore so, so. It, well, I mean, it's kind of a misnomer to say there's no uh, reserve requirement. So the biggest thing with the reserve requirements is you need, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, robustness uh, checking. Uh, I forgot the word that the Fed uses for it. Stress Basically, testing. Yeah, yeah, the stress testing. But there's like a there, there's like an actual like regulation or whatever that has it, right? And so they basically say, all right, we can go to the banks. We expect your big boys. You can handle it. You can figure it out. You have nice, sophisticated statistical models. Uh, we're going to take away the reserve requirement because that's kind of whatever. But we need you to be solvent in these, you know, 20 scenarios that we're going to uh, put you through. Uh, and as long as you're able to meet that, then, uh, you know, you're good. Uh, and so even though you say like, all right, well, I don't have um, I don't have a overall level of control. Well, if you're going through these things, you're implicitly going to have control. The bank can't say, all right, I'm going to have 500 bajillion times leverage. And uh, we're going to give out, you know, a quadrillion dollars for every dollar in deposits because there's no way you're ever going to meet any sort of uh, stress test requirements, right? So while there may not be explicit, they're implicitly there. And that does put a cap on the system in a way that actually makes more sense that comports with reality rather than arbitrarily saying it's going to be 5%, it's going to be 10%. Uh, it's some arbitrary number versus like, hey, um, we're coming out with some more sophisticated ways of actually being able to model like what we don't want to happen. Because that's the point of the reserve requirement is, hey, what happens if your loans start going bad? We want banks to be solvent. We don't want to have to bail people out. We want to make sure that you're doing uh, what's right. We don't want to just arbitrarily put a line in the sand that you can say, oh, look, you said we could go to 20x and we went to 20x and we lost. Oh, no, uh, that's that sucks so bad. But, you know, we followed the law. The, the spirit yeah. and purpose of the law is to be able to withstand those like stress environments and if you're able to do it well who cares if you're at 50 to 1 or 3 to 1 uh, as long as your loans are going to comport with whatever scenarios happen yeah and i and i totally agree with that i think that well 
I don't know. Well, at the same time, I don't know if it's a misnomer to say there's no, because obviously there is no reserve requirement. I get what you're saying though, which is that, well, sort of transitively, there is some sort of upper, you know, upper or lower mm -hmm. bound with regard to how much reserves you have to have on board. But to be fair though, there's market mechanisms that would also control, um, you know, because because in th like, I suppose that in an uncharitable theory, you could say like, oh well, with no reserve requirements, couldn't banks just give out unlimited loans just mm -hmm. perpetually? Like, wh why would they ever yeah. deny someone a loan, right? And it's like, well, there's a lot of reasons actually, but we just have to think, uh, you know, what, well, one sure, one, I mean, one step afterwards. I mean, what you could do basically is get extremely highly leveraged in a bull market, and then take a lot of profits out, and then as soon as uh, everything blows up in the bear market, then. Um, you know, they can't come after you for the money that you took as pro record profits and then you're socializing all the losses. So. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not saying, yeah, exactly. And I'm not saying the stress tests are bad. It doesn't sound like you think yeah. they're a bad idea either. Um, but yeah, yeah, in general, that, the only reason we mentioned the reserve requirement thing is just that, you know, I, I imagine, um, how do I put this? Like, maybe this is an assumption, but I imagine going from, you know, 0% reserve requirement to 10%, that, that might be a bit more of a, that might be more difficult than going from 10 to 20, because if you're in a market that's used to not having explicit reserve requirements, uh, I imagine uh, that might be well, a bit uh, harsher of a transition, but maybe I'm I, yeah, wrong. Yeah, it just depends sense. on, yeah, it's just going to be dependent on like exposure, uh, I guess. Um, it, and so in a place like America, that that's probably going to be pretty true because the credit environment's pretty good. But, you know, if you go to, uh, you know, a developing nation, well, you might not have any issues at all going from zero to 10 because of the environment, uh, the economic environment of living in, let's say, Ukraine right now, right? Banks are absolutely not going to be leveraged up um, that much, excluding the central bank um, and anyone doing business with the government is probably taking as many loans as they can get. But for most commercial banks, well, it doesn't, it's not really, a war zone isn't a conducive environment to be, you know, lending in. And so even economies that aren't, you know, as war-torn as Ukraine or whatever, but they they run a lot more credit risk things of that nature. Uh, you, they may find themselves they're only at three you know three times leverage, five times leverage, eight times leverage, and so going from zero to ten may not be a jump uh, at, at all for them. I, I think yeah. that's kind of important when uh, you know we're talking about these kind of policy prescriptions is they have to be able to be generalizable not just to you know America here in the West but to every single country that you kind of uh or not every country but every economic actor yeah. or system uh that it could possibly apply to it could be applied to martians it can be applied to cavemen out in the <laughs> woods um if it's not generalizable I, I don't think it's very useful um and so again those arbitrary um, limits well uh, i don't know yeah. i i think i disagree somewhat right because we we can imagine that um i don't know if that's true right because we can we can imagine say well, this policy works best for this type of economy, but maybe not for sure. this type of economy. That seems like a pretty reasonable statement, right? Um, sure, yeah, but um, yeah, I, I mean, uh, this is like really hard. So, um, <laughs> it, it, so I think more importantly, it's going to depend on complexity, right? Um, man, so like, what's the easiest way to describe this? So, as we're evolving, like economies, right? The 10 times the 10 percent reserve requirement that's just something fairly easy that takes no compliance at all to check um to check uh basically you just say how much do you have you add it up boom you're either above or below that whereas if you say all right well now we need to do stress tests of your reserves well that's going to take a lot of people a lot of effort um both on the bank side and on the government side right uh in order to run those stress tests and, and see what happens to portfolios um yeah, I can see where that kind of comes from. Yeah, that makes because sense. Because basically, well, if you're in the caveman society, well, it's very, cavemen don't have, you know, all that time and effort to go through the stress tests, right? Yeah. So you're, so, uh, so, okay, that makes sense. So my, so my main argument against MMT is more political in nature, right? It's just, it just doesn't, it, well, I suppose there's some pot shots and then it's mm -hmm. the political argument, right? So the pot shots are that like, number one, banks don't, you know, banks create money, right? So the federal government sure. is not the only entity that can create money. Um, second pot shot is that a lot of the truths of MMT, they seem to almost pretend to be new, like discoveries, but it seems like under a Keynesian analysis, pretty much most of the things about MMT are internalized within like the classic sort of Keynesian framework, um, at least from everything that I've read. Um, and the argument 
you know, holistically against the system is that essentially, even if what you're saying is true, um, I just don't trust the government to do it, <laughs> right? Yeah. I'd rather have a technocratic body uh, do this. Um, and to the extent that someone like Kelton might advocate for a technocratic body determining fiscal packages, it's like, well, that, there's no appetite for that. There's no appetite for basically taxation without representation, not in this country, right? So, I mean, the That's idea of... A, yeah, the idea of a board of a board of people, a board of technocrats, um, being part of the approval process before lawmakers can vote on a package that just doesn't seem like there's an appetite for it. Um, not with any sort of act, actual actionable say. Um, and those are kind of my arguments. But it sounds like your argument is um, almost more historical in nature, right? So, I mean, in terms of MMT and the use of money, uh, how, how do you argue against it? What are your thoughts? Man, there's so many things. So the first thing is, is like, you have to take a look at the descriptive reality um, of how it works. So let's say that it, it works exactly how it does. The government issues money, they buy the things that they want, and then they make sure it has value by taxing it back, right? That's how the government, the, the, the tax cycle goes in MMT. That's how the government gets what they want. And that's how it creates value and that everybody wants to transact with it is because of taxes. I mean, we literally tried this uh, in America during the Civil War with our continental dollars. Um, we didn't have any money, uh, but you know what we did? We did have a printing press and we did have an IOU and we said, look, we're going to take these continental dollars. We're going to go out. We're going to spend them. We're going to buy the things that we actually need, uh, aka pay our army so we can fight Britain off. And then we're going to tax them back uh, after the war. You're going to have to pay in continental dollars. Um, so that's literally the MMT cycle um, in, in a nutshell. But even after the war, um yeah even after the war uh it was uh you know a struggle to get continental dollars to be worth uh, anything even though the federal government was requiring them to be taxed uh back and additionally like they they were just giving man they, they gave like massive premiums to pay in continental dollars uh or it, yeah it was just like a giant mess. Um, <laughs> well why yeah, didn't it, it work was... right why didn't why didn't people respect that they had to pay uh, their taxes with continental dollars. Why didn't it work? Because no one wanted them. They couldn't trade in them. Uh, and yeah, it, it was basically a disaster. Uh, I, I have no idea. I, I don't quite remember the story. It's well, been a while since I, I... Well, what it sounds... Well, I, if I had to guess, though, what it sounds like is the newly created federal government did not have a sophisticated way by which to enforce a collection of taxes. And you know, sort of transitively, they did not have a sophisticated way to enforce the adoption of the new currency, the continental dollar, right? Where an mmt -er might just say, well, obviously, we live in a, you know, modern society now, right? And so if you don't pay your taxes, you're, you're going to get fucked, right? The IRS will come after you because they know who you are and where you live, right? Whereas the same mm -hmm. certainly probably wasn't the case in the late 1700s. Well, I mean, so the thing is, the federal government taxed the state governments directly at that time. This is before federal income tax. So the federal government knew who the state governments were, and they knew who had what type of debt that they had to pay. But the state government still just didn't. Um... Well, sure. But every every criticism I just made, just yeah. knock it down a level to the state governments where they probably didn't have a sophisticated way to collect tax, you know, collect these continental dollars um, and keep track of who owed what and where and, you know. Who, who, where they were and all these all yeah. these problems associated with basically knowing where someone is and the you know bookkeeping standards sure. of the 1700s right sure I, I mean i guess but at the end of the day um if that's how they how it should work uh i guess there's no recognition of why it actually failed i guess or any story of like why things are i mean i guess if you say the tax right. uh, system now is more efficient but just being able to collect taxes it, it, really it doesn't work all else prices, equal yeah is yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. work all else equal, right? You need some sort of either technology or some norm or some sort of, you know, sure. standard, you know, uh, sort of civil society before you, th th this makes any sense, right? Um, and yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that, um, you know, obviously if we're talking about like uh, whatever, you know, whatever, you, you mentioned Ukraine, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, the currency that they use or the, um, you know, the, 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 you know, Syrian dollars or whatever they use over in Syria, right? That's probably not spending too well, even though, you know, the government of Syria requires it for payments because there's... Or the Zimbabwe, I think. It famously sure. said literally, Zimbabwe I dollars. Yeah. yeah, exactly, right? And um, um, 
Yeah, and so you know you need you need some amount of competitiveness with your currency and institutional strength before this story makes any sense. So it sounds like the story should be amended to be, uh, you know, institutional strength probably comes first, right? The thing that mm -hmm. underpins the value of your currency is your institutional strength, um, and from that point on, uh, the faith in your currency is um, the institutional strength, and then the some of the underpinning value would be the collection of taxes in that currency. Sure. And then I guess the value then doesn't come from, it doesn't really stem from the government being able to create it or tax in it. It stems from institutional acceptance of that dollar, right? Right. It's like a social norm, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. Okay. So it sounds like that's part of your historical argument. I mean, is that your main argument against MMT, right? Is, uh, uh, is there... No, there's a lot. I'm going to have to pull up the uh, other uh, document as well. Um, oh, snap. But... Yeah, sorry. Uh, I think I sent it to you. Uh, I don't uh, actually remember. Uh, here we go. Got it. Sorry, it's uh, been a while. Um, man, uh, so that's like one. Uh, the second big one, I, I think, was literally John Law. Uh, sorry, it's coming back to me as I uh, pulled up this uh, document. But, so, <laughs> Was this like your Warren Mosler uh, prep doc or something? Yeah, I have like half of it. The hard drive that it was on died. So like I have like the half of it that was cloud saved and not the half of it that like finished it. So, Damn. so the second like big one um, is kind of um, uh, France under John Law. So do you know the story of John Law or should I retell it? Yeah, tell me. Cool. I don't yeah, know. so John Law, he was a Scottish economist uh, in the 1700s, right? Um, or I guess late 1600s, early 1700s. Uh, he basically was, uh, we'll just put it like he, he's a gambler, right? A gambler and a con man is the best way to describe him, but he was also an economist. Uh, and he, you know, uh, basically no, uh, killed just a man. Just like every in economist. London. Yeah, he killed a man in London, uh, flew. Uh, or fled from justice, went to France, and uh, he went to the French king there. Um, it's uh, the, the name of the book is uh, Money and Trade Considered with a Proposal for Supplying the Nation with Money. So at the time, France was in you know pretty bad uh, debt, right? Uh, and he basically said, uh, in his own words, um, what John Law said is that money belonged to the king, and the king can issue money in multiple terms by changing metal money to paper money because you know it, it doesn't matter; it, it's a relevant unit of account. Um, John Law also said that uh, instead of using silver as the reserve, you can just, you know, why not use land as the reserve, right? You can uh, turn a new paper for silver. Instead of that, you know what? You, you can use land in the, you know, the new world that we have. Since the land belongs to the king and it's available without shortage, you can issue all the paper money that you want, right? Because, you know, you can redeem it for land in the new world. We have a ton of land in the new world. It's not a big deal. Uh, now, because we're issuing this paper money uh, in large quantities, uh, we're going to give it to people. And, you know, people, once they get money, they're going to trade. It's going to be great, right? And then because there's a ton of trade, everyone's going to be prosperous. Uh, and that's basically the MMT story, more or less, right? You know, money belongs to the state or money belongs to the king. Uh, if you make a lot of money, people are going to do things and become prosperous with it, right? They're going to be wealthy and you're going to be able to tax them and you're going to be able to get a lot of money uh, back pretty quickly, right? Um, he goes to the French king, uh, Louis the Fifteenth, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, he basically said, "Hey, you know what? This paper money thing is going to be wonderful. You, you know, you're in huge debt. You've had uh, all these wars. Uh, you know, Louis the Fourteenth spent uh, maybe a little bit too much money on his palaces, and so um, we're just going to replace the gold and silver that we owe uh, with uh, paper money, which will represent shares and you know the economic ventures uh, out in Mississippi, right?" Um, and yeah, that worked uh, well for a little bit of time, right? But, you know, he kept issuing more money. You know, if a little bit of money is good, then a lot of money is going to be great. And that's basically the MMT story. Uh, the economy is going to keep doing better, keep doing better. You're going to issue more money. <laughs> but, you know, as uh, with inflation, you know, everyone realized the money was worthless and the entire economy collapsed, right? Uh, I'm fairly certain that what happened there did more to bankrupt France than like anything that uh, Louis the 14th ever did uh, in terms of fighting or spending or anything else. Mm, yeah. So just, yeah. So one of the, you know, yeah, the we roll back to that argument of, you know, do we really trust the, you know, the, 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 the government, I guess in general to responsibly spend money, right. And French sure. money, I suppose. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Without, without any sort of check and balance outside of just people get really mad when their money is worthless. Right. Um, yeah, basically. Which, uh, 
doesn't always work out. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I mean, I've just noticed, and you know, I agree. Obviously, I mean, I think, uh, you know, again, we 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 might be able to say that on paper. Um, well, I don't know if we could even say. That. I mean, look, I, you know, a sectoral ba a sectorally balanced fiscal package seems to make sense, even in a world where you control inflation with the the fiscal state, right? I mean, that that was part of my MMT video mm -hmm. was that, like, we can agree with a lot of the a lot of the prescriptions of MMT, right? Which is that you know, deficits aren't always bad. Deficits are investments. It's just who you invest in, right? Infrastructure, sure. healthcare systems, like these are things that maybe wouldn't be the worst things to go into deficit to afford. Um, you know, but that doesn't mean that the Federal Reserve doesn't have a you know a meaningful role in controlling, um, ensuring yeah, stability cool. in the price level. Yeah, um, man. So, I, I guess one thing if we're talking about government spending, I guess the question then becomes: How do you measure when it's more effective for the public or private sector to spend on something? Right? How do you make that decision? Um, yeah, and that's I mean, like I think... a big one, especially to the creation of money, right? Yeah, I think that at that point you just you would just you would just have to you know, you'd have to engage in some sort of reasonable economic analysis and framework, right? Um and you know, it's hard for the government to do that sometimes and it's hard for economists to do that a lot of the times. Um but, you know, that th those are the tools that make a lot of sense. And you know, there's a lot of empirics out there. I mean, a lot of stuff has sure. been tried by a lot of different governments, right? You're not always doing like the, yeah, the sure, first but I thing, mean, right? I mean, what's the first measure of economic slack, right? How do you measure that? Because that's that's the point of MMT is they're taking away slack from the system. And there's yeah, no, yeah, there's no. no there's no empirical measure of what that is, or even well, it depends like, on the market, right? It depends on the the individual market, right? So we we I, could probably yeah we, we could probably reasonably say that some markets are you know uh, have room to grow, right? And that an injection of money would cause those markets to grow, right? Yeah, it's that's just true, but to, how much, right? I mean, if we take right, exactly, the, yeah, like. Let's just take the U.S. economy as a whole, right? Because that's what the government's supposed to be regulating. How much slack was there, you know, two years ago at the beginning of COVID? How much slack was there one year? How much slack is there right now? Are we in negative slack? Uh, can you even give me like a close estimation of like what that is? Well, like a ballpark? no, no, no. Is well, there... we're not. Well, we're not talking. I don't think. No, no, because I, 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 I. Yeah, yeah. I think what what I'm really saying is that there are probably a lot of areas for investment that are more easily identifiable than others, right? So I'm not arguing for like sure. full on, you know, go through every single sector of the economy and determine how much slack there is and then give it a sort of proportional amount of money into a government program or some sort of direct mm -hmm. grant or something, right? I'm more saying that, you know, there's areas of the economy where it seems like government involvement and government spending makes a lot of sense, right? And sure. uh, that's where we can probably uh, agree somewhat with MMT people. Um, but then, you know the 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 whole hog of MMT, which is you know oh yeah you know you should try and sectorally balance the entire economy every single year, just doesn't really, I mean it just doesn't really seem very tenable, right? Um, I mean sure. like someone like MM or someone like Stephanie Kelton will say that, um, well you could do this with just like automatic stabilizers, and it's like okay well yeah yeah you can you can it, so in in theory yes right you you could have automatic stabilizers in periods of contraction, um. But like, how do you automatically stabilize individual sectors, right? And like, where your criticism comes in sure, but, I becomes mean, how twofold. How do you change that across time as well, right? We may create a you know a good fiscal stabilizer that'll work for you know 2010, but the economy changes a lot between 2010 and 2012 and 2015 and 2020, right? So how do you start adjusting those automatic stabilizers? How do you even know what the economy looks like, right? Well, yeah, because you could have technological changes that sort of obfuscate the stabilizer sure. itself, right? So someone mentioned, yeah, like, or I mean, oh, you even can... you just have a change in trade, right? So we stopped manufacturing in America over the last twenty years because, you know, it turns out that our competitive advantage isn't um, isn't in manufacturing, um, and uh, even if it's not a change of technology, just a change in trade, a change in our partners, uh, change in availability of supplies around the world, all those can have huge packet. Uh, packages uh, or impacts on the economy and your automatic stabilizer isn't going to recognize that. Yeah, sure. And then there's like, uh, you could say like national security implications, right? Mm -hmm. Where you might sure. actually prefer there to be slack in some markets uh, in the case where, you know, you have uh, bullets, yeah. yeah, steel or bullets or like medical equipment or whatever it is. Right. And sure. it's like, okay, well, you know, how do you make that decision? Right. It's a little easier to make that decision when we're talking about select markets. Right. But mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about implementing like 
of a, you know an infrastructure investment automatic stabilizer it's like well what how do you determine when to turn that on is it tenable to turn it off right so i mean um you know that's where i think you end up with a yeah. lot of trouble um so yeah I think you touched on the two big things about taxes um, when I'm talking about MMT. So one is, like you said, the political will or ability of the government, right? And the second one is frequency of taxing. I think we touched on those. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, to me, the, literally the only tax that I could think of that would quell inflation would would literally be a payroll tax, right? In a way that would be effective. Because yep. in theory, you could, you could implement a payroll tax... Of, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could implement a payroll tax tomorrow and then companies would start deducting from your paycheck, right? But an income tax doesn't work. A VAT tax or a sales tax just increase prices. It doesn't do the opposite, right? Um, and so, you know, I, I don't, I can't, I can't imagine any other tax outside of a payroll tax that would actually even it, it basically even control inflation. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, uh, like uh, an immediate wealth tax. But that's like basically government confiscation. <laughs> yeah, that point. expropriation. Um, yeah, I guess that's yeah. true. <laughs> like we'll just steal money out of your fucking bank account. Um, oh, well, I mean, it would technically work. <laughs> it may not. Oh yeah, I suppose that's true. Cool. Yeah. Um, cool. but yeah, I mean, yeah, it just doesn't seem. I, I've seen some people say like, um, well, we should just like this is where some people bring in the jobs guarantee. Like, oh, you know, well, we should have a jobs guarantee, but then in areas of high inflation, we would just like lower. We would increase the number of unemployed people. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's politically mm -hmm. tenable. Um, yeah. Or like, we should have a UBI, but then like we would just lower the UBI if uh, you know if we have a lot of inflation. It's like, yeah. okay, these are these all just seem equally untenable. Whereas it seems like it seems like interest rates are separated enough by from the consumer that people don't get immediately pissed off when interest rates increase um, mm -hmm. and they're effective at quelling inflation, right? It's like a best yeah. of both worlds. Yeah, so let's see. Another big uh, shot that I have is, so the biggest thing that um, I don't like, um, it's like an accounting principle more or less, but that um, MMT has beat people over the head with. The government deficits add to uh, public savings, right? Um, that's yeah, a yeah. big quote, yeah. But to me, that just literally sounds like fraud, right? If I say, if I go to shareholders and uh, I say, all right, well, by paying me $500 billion per year, you know, I'm creating a massive business deficit. And that's basically like me saving for you by self-enriching, right? Um, if Because, you know, my business deficit is just adding to corporate shareholder savings. Um, Wait, but Rage Pope, Rage Pope. Government deficits aren't the same. Government budgets aren't the same thing as corporate or household budgets. All right. Yeah. You can't use that I mean, example. I mean, it's literally, it, you're just literally using an accounting definition to like justify an action, right? It doesn't, um, it, it doesn't have any meaning towards it b b beyond that. Okay. Well, this is an accounting thing because when we think of savings, um, the, the colloquial definition is a lot different than the accounting definition, but you're kind of using it to conflate the two. Um. It, yeah, because yeah. at the end of the day, the government deficit is saying you're going to have to pay me in the future. Or uh, whereas, and the same thing with the business, it's not actually physical savings uh, of the people. We're not actually, you know, saving money by the government and going out and doing stuff, even though that's the accounting term. Well, sure. I mean, I think that um, it would depend on what you think. It would depend on what you would think is more dangerous, right? And like the mm -hmm. governing structures of your of your debt repayments, right? And this is where sure. I think MMT makes somewhat of a good point, which is to say that um, like really, really over leveraged households is probably worse for the economy than uh, like a high debt to GDP ratio. Right. And so to well, the extent I, I would say that individual yeah. households going bankrupt is a lot worse than, you know, a government collapse, um, which is the end road of uh, government. Right. I mean, take a look at what happens. You, but you'd say it's country. better. I would say it's way better. I, I think yeah, going yeah. through 2008, is infinitely better than what happens when you have actual government collapse because of debt, right? Take a look at, oh man, there's so many. I, yeah, I yeah just yeah, yeah, like Venezuela or whatever, like Weimar Republican shit. Yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. I mean, I, I don't disagree, right? But that's why I try to preface what I said with, you know, the governing structures of of paying back sure. that debt, right? And at least in the case of the United States, right? There's not really. You know, there's no like foreseeable problems with the United States paying off its debt right now. Yeah, for now. To be fair, good. yeah, I was gonna say to to be fair, right? Like this is a um, uh, 
you know, that's a statement with uh, a lot of caveats and it's a statement that's only true for like a handful of countries in the world, right? Almost every country either has like a really significant portion of its debt that's repayable in a foreign currency um, or they're just like not able to issue the bonds in the first place and people don't want the currency. So it just doesn't end up making any sense for most countries in the world. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, And again, I I think if your model is reliant on Western civilization, you're losing a lot of descriptive um, ability of your model and you're losing a lot of generalizability and your ability to make claims about what needs to be done. Um, I I think it's just too hyper specific. Yeah, Yeah, that's true. I mean, I don't think I don't know if MMT, I don't know if MMT advocates uh, would typically claim that like every country could operate under this framework because that's just obviously not true. Um, True. Because, like, you've got countries like Ecuador that don't even issue their own currency or, like, all of the EU countries. Or, Mm -hmm. obviously, you've got countries like, you know, Argentina that uh, it's, like, almost, like, a shitload of their debt is just repayable in, like, euros and dollars and stuff like that. Man, if it's... If you're trying to say that this is how economies operate, here's the money story, here's how money is created and used, and then you go look at places that don't have their own currency, that don't issue but still tax, how do those... How do they operate on, under that definitionally, right? It, it just well, yeah, I think they don't, right? So, like, I think yeah. that like what what Kelton will say, like, because obviously one of the main things that like one of the more idiotic criticisms that people will make about MMT is like, oh, you know, oh, if we had MMT, like other countries have tried MMT and they had a lot of inflation, and it's like, okay, well, y- y- you know, number one, Kel- a person like Kelton's going to have a narrative for why all those things happened, right? And so sure. um, people bring up Greece and it's the fact that they don't issue their own, their own currency. People bring up uh, the Weimar Republic or like Venezuela and they talk about how, oh, well, the reason that those happened, well, the Weimar Republic happened because industry left and then Venezuela happened because they had no control over currency printing, right? And so mm-hmm. um, I just don't know if that's like a, a good criticism uh, in general, right? I think that what, to me, what makes more sense is just to say that um, and to be fair, like you're right, like maybe some MMTers will literally say like this is how just economies work, whereas what right. seems to more real more in reality be the this case is, is how that a small subsector appears to work. Yeah. This is how a small subsector of like really really privileged economies work, right? Like this right. is just not a, a thing that makes a lot of sense for most economies. Now, um, and to be fair, like I think that that's where we end up with um, the most like to me the the most not an argument, but really just the thing to point out, which is that like, yeah, but at the same time, right? Like, is it good for a country like Sri Lanka or something like that to, you know, run a deficit and invest in like a water, a waterway or like electrification project? Well, the answer is yes, but the answer isn't yes because of MMT, right? The answer is yes because of like standard economic theory that's been around for like almost a hundred years, right? It's called Keynesianism, right? So why does it become... (laughs) Why does it even become unique? I mean, it's not even not even in Keynesianism. Uh, I would say even a lot of like classical or neoclassical would say you're going to have a positive expected value on society, so the government should do it regardless, right? Um, yeah, sure. Or sure. And impress people into labor or whatever instead of taxing, but that's like a whole other. That's like a, I don't know, a, a governance thing as opposed to debt issuance. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. All right. So the next big one. All right. So there's a really good paper. Uh, I want to see this is. Um, oh, shit. Papers. Yeah, this is from 1995. Uh, it's um, money demand and seniorage maximizing inflation. Uh, I think I gave you the link to it. Uh, I'll uh, drop it in the chat to you guys uh, and then I'll drop it to you as well. So um, the biggest thing uh, I think out of this paper is uh, in the 1990s, they basically went and they said, OK, well, how much money could we really create? Like how much of the GDP could we get um, if, you know, you're going to maximize, you know, money through creation rather than taxation, right? Um, And I think they found that you could stably get about 4% of GDP. Um, Let me take a look at my notes. Yeah, so uh, for the United States anyways, the maximum long-term sustainable revenue from creating money is like 4% of GDP. Right. Uh, so if you just wanted to create as much money as you wanted, uh, you could get roughly 4% of, um, 4% of whatever the output of the nation is, yep. but that would put our inflation at 266% per year. So, and so, yeah, but when this paper says create money, they're literally talking about just like telling the, the mint to just create, yep. you know, new money. 
Well, that's the same thing that uh, the MMT says. You just run the mint, you get the money that you need, and then you tax it back later, right? Uh, so yeah. I guess maybe they're not accounting for the tax back, but um, I would assume in the long run, that would effectively be the same thing, right? Because they're saying that, uh, man, what is, what's the business here? But they're basically saying that if you run the money printer, what can you get? Uh, and the answer is 4%. Maybe you can tax it back right. and maybe you can get rid of inflation. But at the end of the day, uh, at least for that year, you're only going to be getting 4% of GDP, um, no matter how much you print. Well, what's the narrative? Because I think like like you could just say like, well, what do you what do you mean we'd have 260% inflation because we took out, you know, what was it, like 25% of GDP in terms of a stimulus this past year, right? So, you know, what would your response to that be? Because, uh, I mean... Well, because it's, it sounds like we're, you know, c c splitting hairs between like yeah, printing sure. money physically and then like just issuing the bonds, which, you know, are repayable in our own currency anyway. Well, because they're, they're and it, this is the biggest thing that I struggle with is explaining the difference between. So the, the biggest thing for inflation is expectations of will things be more expensive in the future? And so if you create a physical dollar, well, that dollar is going to be around forever until somebody decides to destroy it, right? Um, whereas when the Federal Reserve, quote unquote, creates money in the money supply, there's a time limit uh, that that money is in existence. It's a finite amount uh, of time that it's in existence. So if the Fed undergoes like a repo for a 90-day treasury bill, well, what happens is, is, say they give out a million dollars for that treasury bill, and now they get this treasury bill. Uh, there's a million dollars that's technically created at that point in time, but in 90 days, the federal government gives the money to the Federal Reserve, who then says, okay, well, now I destroy that money and that $1 million that I created is now destroyed. So there's a lifetime yep. uh, to that money that's created. So the expectation then becomes not that this money is going to be around forever, but it's going to be around for a period of time. And there's also the expectation that should that money need to be destroyed faster, the Federal Reserve can then go sell that bond into the market uh, and destroy that money at an even faster rate. Right? Yeah, and to so, be fair, we're, you're just talking about debt that's monetized, right? Because in theory, yeah. just issuing debt on the open market, that's not creating money at all, right? Because you're just taking Correct. money you know, from one place to another. You're talking about specifically oh, yeah, debt the, the that is... Oh, yeah, the argument that monetizing debt for the federal government, that's the same thing as money creation, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I get what you yeah, yeah, I got yeah. one step ahead. So for the first thing is, uh, I guess for everybody, the first step uh, for the government deficit spending right now is the federal government goes out to the open market and they say, hey, we need to spend some extra money. We'll give you some interest. We need a loan. Who's willing to give us a loan? So they go out to what's mostly United States citizens or United States corporations, and they say, hey, who will give us some money? And so people do give the government money in exchange for interest rates. And then the argument then becomes, well, those institutions or people just go repo it to the Fed, who then is monetizing the debt effectively. So, uh, And then once it's become effectively monetized, then what I described before happens is because those debt instruments are what are taken up by the Fed, the money gets destroyed or society expects it to be destroyed, which then uh, clamps down on the inflation versus actually printing money versus monetizing the debt through the Fed, uh, which is the big argument that's made. Right, right. I get what you're saying. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, yeah. I mean, that's understandable. I mean, I think that uh, trying to think of like a satisfactory response that an immateer could give in that regard. Um, hmm. Um. Well, I mean, I guess. Well, I guess uh, to me at least, I don't. I've never outside of this conversation, I've never heard of an immateer who is literally like, ah, yes, money is only when you make physical like coins and notes, right? I think that what an MMT -er might just say is like, well, yeah, but then we just, we could just like monetize most or like all federal debt, right? Um, and that seems to be the mechanism that I've seen a lot of people advocate for from MMTers, right? They, they won't say like, we're going to monetize the debt, right? But they'll basically right. just say, well, the Fed can just create the money and then buy back the bonds that the government issues, right? Which is well that's monetizing the debt right yeah sure it gets monetized in the short run but in the long run it's expected to go away if that debt monetization if uh, it becomes permanent then i think you're going to see persistent high inflation right it's because right now we still have the expectation that the fed can um handle we'll taper inflation. off and yeah okay yeah. Yeah, that makes sense yeah but you're but saying you're that saying that the case, then we'll see that persistent high inflation because inflation is extremely difficult to predict, but it seems to be most reliant on perceptions and institutional credibility. 
And that's why the Fed's fighting so hard to say, look, it's under control. We're going to have rate rises. We're going to be more transparent. Here's how the tapering is going to work. So it calms the markets uh, and it sets expectations that, hey, this is going to come down. This money supply is coming down. You don't need to permanently think about every year all this money being created by the Fed and just sticking around forever. Right. And so what you're saying is that if the norm was monetization of debt, right, and it was like, oh, yeah, every year the Fed's going to like monetize 80 percent of the government's debt or whatever, then that creates a whole other set of expectations, mm -hmm. which probably includes basically people expecting a shitload of inflation and then inflation, basically expectations create the actual inflation itself a lot of the times. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, it, exactly. Because then what happens is, you know, people start pricing it into their contracts uh, which leads to, you know, their suppliers or their, uh, you know, the people purchasing it from them uh, ending up saying, okay, well, now our expectations are higher. Now that's going to go into wages, it's going to go into prices, and it spirals out of control from there. Yeah, um, yeah that makes sense. Which theory of inflation that you go through, if you look at Keynesian or post Keynesian or neo Keynesian or insert your favorite one here, it, it's all expectations. <laughs> yeah, all yeah, expectations. yeah, of course. Um, and that's why, yeah, that's why a lot of the rhetoric today is like, you know, well, expectations seem to have become de-anchored to a certain extent on in terms of inflation or like not de-anchored, but like it seems like well, when people say de-anchored, the they short just mean, term. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like people just mean, well, expectations are higher. Um, but all right. What's your next point, Rach Poe? This has been very informative. Uh, let's see. Oh, so the natural rate of interest being zero. Oh, man. That oh, one that, really that's, that's one that gets your goat. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, there's a million reasons why we have low and steady inflation, right? And that it tends to be that economies grow the best when there's a reason for people to participate in the economy, right? Um, if I can get the same thing today as tomorrow, uh, I'm just, uh, th there's no difference uh, to me if I hold my money or not, right? And whether or not it's productive. Um, if inflation is extremely high, um, then I have to buy something today. Uh, and then my decision making is going to be like really skewed as well, right? Because if I don't go immediately after work, take my wheelbarrow full of money to buy a loaf of bread, I'm just not going to be able to buy anything tomorrow morning. That's going to be, you know, a disaster. So um, it, it seems like uh, if we're looking at, you know, maximizing economic growth, which is probably something that we should uh, want uh, in, in general, maybe. Um, well, for the sake of growth isn't good, but uh, technologically progressing, becoming more sophisticated is as a whole pretty good for society. Um, it, it seems like the natural rate of interest should be that low inflation that we're targeting. So people have an incentive to participate in society, but not so much that it forces them to make decisions that they wouldn't otherwise make, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah. It's like the, uh, it's not the Fisher rule, but there's some, is it the Fisher rule? There's, there's a rule in economics, which is that um like uh you know your nominal interest rates will tend to track with inflation to some extent right because you know you don't want to uh if you're giving out a loan right you don't want the uh you know you don't you don't want all your gains to be eaten away by inflation right so if inflation's yeah. like persistently a certain amount then you end up with uh uh interest yeah, rates the real being... interest rate yeah the real interest rate tends to remain the same i think yeah yeah exactly whatever that ends yeah. up being um yeah okay that makes sense. So your argument is that, you know, the natural rate of interest uh, is not, well, it's, it's, it, it probably can't be zero because there's usually some amount of healthy inflation that's happening. Yeah. Um, and um, well, also it, it, people are going to want some compensation for risk. That's right. And that's, too. yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the other thing um, that, you know, people are going to, yeah, people are going to want that uh, compensation. Now to be fair, um, I think Kelton and people who say that they're really just talking about the overnight rate, right? So you're saying that, well, the natural rate of even the overnight rate probably isn't, it's not just like it's naturally zero. zero. Yeah. Okay. I see. Because it, because um, at the end of the day, if the overnight rate is zero, well, I'm always going to take, uh, let's, let's call it our risk-free treasury bond. Right. Um, and then nobody's going to want to hold money because you can always be getting paid interest. Uh, there has to be a trade-off um, in terms of what you're holding. It just doesn't okay. make sense that you, you're just going to have dollars versus something else and expect to not get compensated for providing somebody access to the dollars that they need. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it does make sense um, because, you know, obviously, uh, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I mean, basically, what you're all, all you're saying is that, like, why would they ever provide the service of giving you the, you know, the uh, what do you call it? The overnight loan if mm -hmm. it was just 
like if there's no return at all associated with yeah, it, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Um. No free see, lunches, right. even in banking. <laughs> Not even in banking. Um. Um. Two hundred percent. Thanks to Biden, Taryn Fear says. <laughs> I agree. Bi- hashtag Biden inflation. Hashtag let's go, Brandon. Jesus. Um, all right. So, oh, all right. So here's another thing. Um, man. Uh, all right. So MMTers basically argue that adding more money to the economy more or less. All right. I just got a sub. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so the big thing with the MMT is. Man, they say that, you know, creating money is what makes the economy do better. But I don't think it's the creation of the money. I think it's the distribution of the money that's coming out of the government to the sector, right? If just adding more money to the money supply would um, would uh, make everybody better, we can just say, all right, well, everybody just add a zero, <laughs> take a Sharpie, add a zero. There's now more money in the economy, right? That well, yeah, but that that sounds pedantic, though, because I, I well, obviously sure. I think that an MMT would say that, you know, of course, it matters how you spend the money, right? How, you know, how it's yeah. distributed, of course. Yeah, but I mean, at the end of the day, they just and this is like really hard uh, because they basically say the government just because it I'm just trying to think of like. Well, like, I don't think like it, like an MMT, like if, if the government, mm-hmm. you know, if the, if, the, if the mint printed of eight hundred dollars sure. and then just put that in a shoebox in one of the mint's closets, right? I don't think an MMT sure. would say that like that's causing economic growth, right? So uh, obviously sure, but... the money has to distribute in such a way that causes uh, productive uh, forces to act upon it. it. Exactly. But I don't know if like the the creation of money is irrelevant to that, right? It, it's not the money creation process that has any impact on that. It's the decision making and the targeting that has like the impact, right? Um, and and it, I, I think that's outside of what the dollar does, because at the end of the day, the dollar doesn't mean anything. Um, it's how you're distributing effort. And by creating the money, you're just redistributing effort in other ways. Right. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, I mean, it, 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 it does to some extent, but I, I think that the point that MMT makes that I think I'm somewhat sympathetic to is the idea, like, I think that... um. I think infrastructure is probably a good, you know, yeah, but, it's, pro- but, it's pro- it, probably it's, a good it's, example where it's, well, it's just, good regardless of the system and how you pay for it. Right. Well, no, um, no. But what, I, what I'm saying is that like in the case of infrastructure, right. If the government wanted to just double the amount of spending it did on infrastructure. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, in, in, in theory, this probably wouldn't cause that much generalized inflation. Um, but it would result in like double the amount of infrastructure getting built, right? Because it seems like this is just, you know, there's there's the land there, there's the demands for infrastructure, either upgrades or new infrastructure. Mm-hmm. But it's it's just a money, it is a money problem, and money solves that problem, right? Not sure, but it has coercive power to tax. So why is creating money better than just coercively taxing or just enslaving people to build the infrastructure? How do you coercively tax and then that creates a building that you're building? Well, I'm, just, I mean, I'm because, confused by what you mean. So I, I go and I just say, all your billionaires, give me your money. We're now making schools free, right? Um, or, you know, we're just going to take you guys and for three months you're going to build roads. Because we oh, I guess, well, yeah, I guess, I, I guess like, an MMT would... Yeah, yeah and it, well, an MMT would... Difference. Well, uh, I mean, there's there's definitely a difference, right? I mean, I think MMT would say that, um, y- you know, number one, you know, we slavery's wrong, right? So we don't want to just well, enslave sure. people. Um, and then two, yeah, who cares? Uh, economic systems are irrelevant to moral systems. Well, uh, well they're, they're, function outside. Eh. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't really agree with. That. I mean, there's, you know, there's normative. Uh, you, you make a lot of normative. Uh, you know, okay, just, you make you make a lot of normative statements in economics. Uh, I would say, and I would say that you know an MMT. Well, would, I mean, would... I would say effectively, there is like very little difference. Assuming that your efficiency was the same, there's like no difference between making you spend six months building roads versus taxing half your paycheck to 
build roads. Well, well, sure, but pra- but practically speaking, right? When we're talking yeah. about like we've got three options, right? We've got sure. ins- enslaving the number of people taken to yeah. cultivate the inputs and create the yeah. infrastructure. We've got you know printing. Excuse me. We've got running a deficit slash printing a money. Um, and then like, you know, giving that either to government suppliers or government actors to build the infrastructure. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on the third option, we've got, you know, basically raising taxes on people and or wealthy people alone and yeah. then distributing that money in the same way as an option too. Sure. And I think what an MMT would just say is that like, it's obviously way easier to just run the deficit rather than, you know, having to collect the taxes and or enslave the people. Right, so you're just adding okay. like transaction cost to this that you otherwise need not if you're uh, if you can just run the deficit. But, but I mean, fundamentally, there's there's no difference as long as the roads getting built. There's no impact to society besides just political ease, um, well, which makes I it mean, seem like it's outside the economic system. Well, I mean, I think that an MMT would say that enslaving a portion of your population to build infrastructure for another portion would create, you know, obviously an economic trade off yep. there. Um, because you've got productive actors that are being taken from what they're doing now, and they're just being distributed to another portion of the economy. Yep. Um, yeah. So it's like a distribution thing of just it's just a distribution of wealth problem. It, it's irrelevant to whether or not you need to create money or you need to tax money or you need to do whatever. Right. It's just outside of the description of the monetary system they're trying to describe. No, I'm because sure no, no, it's it's that. it's not because again, if you're so if you've got, even if you're talking about infrastructure workers, right? So uh, we're now forcing infrastructure workers to to work twice as long because we're enslaving them for half of their working day to build twice as much infrastructure. Well, no, maybe we're, we're enslaving other people to do things, right? We, because we don't want as many, I don't know, uh, bit streamers, right? And then we're well, right, we're well, right. But then, but, but, yeah, exactly. That's, that's, but, it's just distribution. It's just distribution, right? And instead of... Well, no, no, because in theory, in, it, in theory, these people are already doing... We're taking people who are already doing a productive economic activity, and we're saying you're not allowed to do that. So we're decreasing output in that regard. Oh, and I mean, we're increasing yeah, I mean, I'm assuming there's no. I'm assuming there's like no loss, right? No economic productivity loss. You can just switch laborers between whatever. Um, right, but I I don't know. I mean, when we th- when we think about, I mean, even if we if we think about basically just like de- if we think about like su- uh, d- just the demand supply model, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, if if we're move, we're, it's kind of like you're saying we're moving along the curve, right? Whereas what an MMT would say is injecting money into the system shifts the curve to the right, right? And these are these these are different things. You know, more income into a system would shift the curves, whereas just you know taking some inputs and you know arranging them a different way wouldn't uh, well, expand no, the bounds. You're, you're expanding the curve by changing the the pool of workers, right? Because be, because well, not the, say not the like aggregate five. curve, right? <laughs> you know, like I said, we're, we're shifting a little bit, but in terms of the infrastructure, well, you know, in terms of the well, infrastructure well, curve, yes. We're talking but... about distribution. Yeah, well, we're talking about distribution of effort, right? So you're shifting all the curves. Uh, it, it just depends on the policy lever, which is kind of outside of whether or not it makes sense to print money. It, it just makes sense to have those curves shift by whatever means necessary. Maybe maybe slavery is a bad example of that, but effectively, right? At the so end yeah, of the day, yeah, yeah. So you're saying you you know you might have it's it, I see what you're saying. So you're saying so, so, you know so, you might have you might have you might have uh, markets that have slack. And what an MMT might say is, or what you might say to an MMT is, you know, there's no difference between enslaving the workers in slack in markets with slack right. and making them build infrastructure, um, and just printing the money and giving it to the infrastructure actors, right? Because we're we're yeah. just playing with each individual sector curve at that point. Yeah, it, exactly. It doesn't. It, it's irrelevant to whether or not mo- money is created or not. About whether or not it's a good for society. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I was just. I was. Yeah. It seemed. Okay. It seemed like we were bouncing between aggregate supply and then individual. Yeah, supply yeah, yeah, yeah. I, okay. I just. Yeah, I'm just not really clear okay. on how to like elaborate that point better. If that makes sense. Um, yeah, because I see a lot what of what they're, a lot of what they're saying is outside the aggregate and on individual things, and it doesn't matter how you influence them. It, it just seems like because it would be a good thing to influence it then you can do it through the mo- through monetary creation as opposed to monetary creation is the best tool to influence it in these ways right no i see what yeah. you're saying that makes sense yeah. um and, and so yeah so it, i i don't man i haven't taken any logic courses but that's basically because the end <laughs> is good then you can just do it through whatever means whereas we're arguing over what means are the best way to get to the end 
Does that make sense? It does. That's, like, and to yeah, be honest, yeah. Rage Pub, nobody <laughs> should take a logic course or any philosophy yeah. course. Okay, let's true. be true. True. Uh, oh fuck. <laughs> Sorry, I'm uh, <laughs> yawning a little bit. Um, what okay. else do you have on the agenda? I've got maybe twenty minute, twenty good minutes left in me before I fall asleep. Goodness, Rage Pub, you worked hard today. Yeah. Um, well, the problem is basically. I was supposed to fly back Tuesday night and be home at 10 and start work at 6, but instead I got a midnight flight that landed at 6, and so I got like three hours of sleep on the plane and then worked like a full day and then some, and then I only got like eight hours of sleep last night, so I'm still like way behind. Mm, I see. Well, this, like... this, this, this is like a working trip. <laughs> kind of. Uh, not really, but... I see. That makes sense. Well, um, what do you think uh, about the Federal Reserve and what they're doing? Do you think they should raise rates more aggressively? Rage Pope. Oh, this is uh, this is like a really tough one because I don't actually have access to like the models that they do, um, and I can only kind of guess at what they're thinking. But so the two policy tools that they need to do right now to control inflation are one, they need to raise rates, but two, they need to decrease the money supply. And I don't know the exact impact of what raising the rates does versus, say, removing a trillion dollars off their balance sheet does, right? I can make uh, some pretty good estimates about what it does to the market. or uh, And by that, I mean, we can take a look at what happened in 2018. Um, and, and so the question then becomes, how much of a hit to the market versus of getting money off the books does versus raising interest rates? And then how you want to control those two levers and then how we're actually going to have fiscal responses as well as are appropriate uh, to kind of go along with those tools, right? Um, because they have to unwind their balance sheet and they have to raise interest rates. Uh, and both of those tools will fight inflation, right? By shrinking the money supply, well, you're going to naturally decrease inf uh, inflation. By raising the interest rate, you're naturally going to decrease uh, inflation. Um, but you have... A a lot of other tools going on as well in the world that you're going to need government responses to. So for instance, well, what happens if Russia cuts off the European Union from oil and gas, right? Well, that's going to have huge implications, especially if you're living there, but even us in America, because we're heavily dependent on the supply chain and that's going to change, that's going to mess all sorts of things up um, for the world um, if that happens. And so you're going to have to have a government response to that. Well, what's that going to be? And then how is the Fed really going to do anything about that? And what's the appropriate response? Is it going to be, you know, we're just going to have more inflation and we're going to ease so our economy does better? Are we going to eat the few percentage point loss in, um, you know, unemployment? Uh, and how does the dual mandate of the Fed of low unemployment and low inflation, how are they going to interpret that vision? Um, it, it's, it's very, very difficult. Uh, I think the Fed is in a very bad position uh, right now, and I think they're going to take a lot of blame for stuff that's almost certainly on the fiscal political side. So, I guess. I mean, even in the 1970s when we had the oil embargo, right, it seems like the Fed raising interest rates still quelled inflation. So I don't know. Yeah, if, but it, um... also, it also damaged the economy, right? Uh, and that was, you know... That was damaging the economy coming out of a pretty big uh, bull market in the 50s and 60s uh, into somewhat the 70s. Whereas now, where Europe's still under the hangover of um, 2008, we kind of got out of it at the beginning of the Trump administration, but we just got walloped by COVID. Uh, so it's kind of like shock after shock. Um, whereas then it was like more of a clean slate, right? And we're still trying to figure out how to reset from the last one. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I think that um, yeah, a lot of a lot of those kind of efforts to try and quell those supply chain problems are more long term visions, um, mm -hmm. or like medium term. Um, like you got you got like European partners that are making their climate uh, pledges like way more aggressive. So I think that uh, I think I want to say Germany, for instance, the governing coalition of Germany is proposed. Uh, I think by twenty thirty, instead of forty percent renewables, they want to have like seventy percent or something like yeah. a really like a way more aggressive target. <laughs> Um, well, see, cause so. that's the only policy tool that they have to get off of Russian gas, right? That's not really a, a good choice for them, but it's the only one that they can make. They already shot themselves in the foot with nuclear. So what do they have left to get off of? Um, th all they have left is basically renewables to go to. Well, uh, imports, to I mean, 
Yeah, imports are renewables. Imports, yeah. imports um, from where though? Well, from uh, yeah. When I say, I, I mean obviously imports not from Russia. Yeah, I mean they they either have to rely on like people are saying Qatar or the U.S. But I mean the problem with that is that there's not like a ton of um like there's not a ton of just excess you know gas that's Depressed. being created. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, but more yeah. importantly, there's no way to transport gas across the ocean, right? Um, it's well, LNG. that's where people yeah talk about LNG, I guess. But that's kind of a emerging uh, yeah, emerging tech, I guess. Yeah, it's years out. You're going to need a ton of infrastructure spending, um, and that's if it's even viable to continue, right? Because right now we have so much gas because of fracking, um, and, and that's why natural gas is incredibly cheap here in America and why it's kind of cheap around the world. But what happens if we ban fracking? Well, then now you've invested in all this LNG infrastructure, and then we just don't have any LNG because we're not fracking, right? Um, and now well, you've invested I mean, all this money in these LNG ships, and what are they going to carry? Right? Yeah, to be to be fair though, I don't I don't think there's any I don't think there's any chance that the U.S. like bans fracking. <laughs> That'd be really oh, surprising. Sure, but I mean, if it becomes um, more restrictive, um, yeah, if yeah, there's a lot of things that can happen that are policy dependent that can make the decision to rely on imports a lot less of a certainty than all right. Well, you know what? We know these dams are going to work. We know this nuclear power plant's going to work. We know these solar panels or this wind. Uh, and push them in that way because the uncertainty, yeah. right? No, that's true. That's true. I mean, that's that's definitely fair enough. Um, I think that it'll be interesting to see because everyone's just looking at Germany right now, basically, with regard to the, you know, what are they going to do with Russian, these Russian gas imports? Um, mm -hmm. The European Parliament just voted to ban Russian gas imports, but it was, a, that's kind of a, well, it's basically a ceremonial vote at this point, yeah. right? Because um, as far as I'm aware, um, I'm aware the European Parliament doesn't actually uh, make legislation. They can only approve legislation that's presented to them. So the vote that they took was it's... actually more of a resolution. Um, the European so... Parliament's a mess. It reminds me of uh, the U.S. and the Articles of Confederation, right? It's well, I've said this it... for a while that the EU they they dream of one day being the United States, where they're basically a federalized country, but they're in that transition period where mm -hmm. you know people are. Trying, you know, getting a little upset about that, and you know, I guess it, I don't know. I guess so I can understand if they join the United States, they can be with us on exactly. Yeah, no, we'll I mean, forty or fifty states. I get, you know, I, I don't know. It seems like these Europeans. It's it's weird to see. Um, like you created the EU, but then there's all these concerns about autonomy as well. Like for instance, yeah. um, uh, states people. <laughs> well, states' rights is a thing, but it's it seems like uh, you know. Like, it's not like, you know, the UK left the EU, right? There's not really any tr risk of a state leaving the United States, right? So, well, um, not anymore. Not after we had our first civil war, who knows? Maybe, that's uh, true. Maybe yeah. Germany is going to go to war to France when uh, Le Pen wins. Yeah. I mean, I just, that all seems very unlikely. But, you know, there's these weirdly controversial things about like, um, like, oh, uh, people will talk about, like, uh, oh, oh, you know, having a European army. It's like a very, like, oh, I don't know if that's, that's a very taboo subject. It's like, I don't fucking see why. You guys are all in NATO anyway. Like, would it really be that big of a deal to put a fucking, uh, you know, what is it, a 13, what's their flag called? The 13 star European flag uh, on a soldier's, uh, you know, l lapel or whatever, instead of just their country flag? I mean, that doesn't seem like the most. <laughs> well, know, I mean, the thing then becomes like uh, command, right? Because what happens when the uh, German guy gets in charge again? The French aren't going to like it, and the French aren't going to want the Germans, and no one wants uh, the Greeks running the army, right? Look, it's, okay. Uh, nobody a... likes, look, nobody in Texas likes it when a New Yorker says anything, all right? But guess what? We still got to deal with each other in the armed forces and when we're paying taxes and how they can vote and it affects us. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just part of being a fucking federal system, my boy. All right. Yeah, but the, the Europeans, oh. uh, they, they haven't evolved. They're not uh, as uh, advanced as we are over here. They're not America. as collaborative, it sounds like, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, they're goodness. fine collaborating under our direction, but they're not uh, fine collaborating with themselves. It's like the teacher in front of the classroom. The kids don't want to, you know, listen to each other, but they'll listen to us. So. Exactly. And those children Europeans just need to get their shit together. Um True. I agree, Rage Pope. Well it was good, uh good oh my goodness, my uh my headphones are uh they're actively falling apart, but good Jeez. talking to you, Rage Pope. <laughs>